Did you know that in the 1980s, New Zealand was almost broken? Well, our next guest has a lot to say about that turnaround, and it's a very exciting story, so please stay tuned. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense, and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. Well, welcome everybody. Did you know that in the 1980s, New Zealand was in big trouble? In fact, many said at the time that New Zealand was broken. Large deficits, big debts, and an awful lot of broken confidence and trust that New Zealand as a country could move forward. Our next guest is um, an expert and authority in that regard. He was the finance minister with a team of people with the then prime minister to be able to turn that situation around. We're so grateful today to welcome a friend of Frontier, um, the great Sir Roger Douglas uh, from uh, New Zealand uh, today. Welcome, uh, Roger. Uh, it's great to be here. Well, Roger, we're uh, delighted that you could join us today. And I, I just want to um, ask if you could just help us set the stage. What was really going on in New Zealand at that time? Was it an overstatement to say that uh, New Zealand was broken? Was it, was it going bankrupt? What was going on? No, we were close to being broke. Um, we had a huge fiscal deficit. We had a huge... Uh, overseas deficit. Um, we were trying to prop everybody up. So we had subsidies for farmers, subsidies in a different form for manufacturers, you name it. Um, uh, we had put it in place. So, you know, farmers uh, paid high taxes in order to subsidize manufacturers. Manufacturers paid high taxes in order to subsidize farmers. It was crazy. Wow. So you were the finance minister during that time. You came in during um, the election in the 1980s. When exactly was that election and and how did you feel uh, the prime minister of the day and that team um, had a mandate to make change? How did that come about? Well, I think change was frankly inevitable. Uh, you need to remember that the day we arrived, the banks were closed to foreign exchange transactions. So that uh, ensures that you actually focus your mind. And I think we were lucky. We were lucky in two ways. I think we had an exceptional cabinet. Uh, and if you think about uh, that, the one thing that was exceptional about it was not only did we realise that there were, we were as a country, we're in a lot of trouble. We also recognised that we needed to do something about it. And in doing something about it, we would possibly uh, lose the next election. We actually realised that we couldn't win in terms of what was good for the country if we weren't prepared to lose in terms wow. of what might have been politically good. And I think wow, that that's, was, that's, that's that amazing. Was, that, that was something that was unique. We didn't talk about it, but just basically people realised that. I think our uh, two historians in the Cabinet, both of who taught or lectured at uh, Auckland University, they probably uh, were, they both um, thought we'd probably lose the election. You can't do these things, Roger, uh, and, and, and expect to win. Uh, but deep down, I always felt, and I know that there were others in the cabinet who felt that there was a lot of common sense out there amongst the ordinary public, that they make hard decisions um, every day of their life. Uh, you know, uh, more food on the table or education. They, they, they're used to trade-offs. Uh, wow. And so uh, that's a kind of an extraordinary story and insight because so often the perception of many politicians is it just it's a, it's kind of a game it's about money power and staying in office regardless of 
frankly, the principles, whereas you, it sounds like your team came in with a, a real sense of commitment and courage to the point where you said, you know what, we just may not get the next election. Is that right? Absolutely. And I think we were helped in that we had an exceptional uh, group of people in the, in the civil service at that time. Uh, certainly, I, I just don't think uh, they, they do in New Zealand uh, to the same degree at the moment. Uh, and that helped. I mean, um, uh, they uh, had done a lot of work in terms of how this, um, the government's uh, trading organisations, for example, should be run. And so we saw enormous efficiency gains in that regard. Wow. So as you reflect on these kinds of changes and as we look to today, why is this topic or why has this kind of work been for you so important? What, what's really at stake when you, when you step back and look at it and say, well, why would we go through all the hassle of trying to, frankly, reform um, on an almost bankrupt country? It's really quite, a, quite a, uh, uh, an enormous undertaking. What, what was really at stake behind this in your mind? Well, I think, um, I mean, if, if, if I'm in part politics, um, what is my goals? What is my objective? The only real objective I should have is to act in the interest of the nation as I see it. Now, I can be wrong, but you need to have that as your goal. Too many people go into politics uh, where um, they're tied, if you like, to a politi particular political party. And I think one of the things about my career, probably not necessarily a good one, is that I um, wasn't um, tied so much to the political party. I always try to act in the interest of what I thought was the interest of the country. And I got sacked a few times for doing that. You know, I did a, um, a book... Uh, in the 1970s and I wrote various papers and I was on the front bench of the Labour Party but you know because I did this and it wasn't Labour Party policy and uh, the leader didn't like it and 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 that's you know quite important factor I think in you talking about the, the, the people I mean I, my, I remember Mike Moore who was uh, head of uh, trade um, World Trade Organization. He was in our cabinet, and Mike wasn't very well for a while, and recently died. And I used to go and see him once a month, or Michael Bassett, and um, we'd talk about things, and we, and I'd say, well, Mike, if 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 you believe that, what? Why are you um, so still tied to the Labor Party so close? He says, Roger, I'm tribal. And, and you know, that's what a lot of politicians, they're tribal. Mm. You know, they're Democrats right or wrong or, or liberal right or wrong. Whereas mm -hmm. you want more people, I think, in politics yeah. who make a judgment and are prepared to stand up and say what they really believe. I think it's Thomas Sowell, was it? If you want to help people, you tell them the truth. If you want to help yourself you tell them what they want to hear. Exactly. And too, and too many politicians are telling people, they poll, they tell people what they, what the polls uh, have told them they want to hear, and, and as a result, the country gets nowhere. Yeah, who are you really serving? I think in that context, one of the things that does strike me is the whole issue of truth-telling and facts and evidence. It's almost like, within this current culture of, um, without trying to sound too philosophical, where, you know, it's all about your truth. Uh, it's kind of the, the postmodern idea that truth can be very relative or, or dynamic, so to speak. But in this environment of polarization and conflict, it seems like we're, we're being challenged to be unified in working together as a team for the interests of our country. And I think one of the key variables has been the media, quite frankly. And uh, how important was it to have a solid 
set of frankly media partners who could really work as as good solid journalists uh, as you looked at the the story of turnaround in New Zealand well I think uh, over the last 30 years well, in the 80s or 70s probably there were the people who were working within the the press gallery in parliament they were some very good journalists uh, mm. in there but also it's changed a lot you know uh, it probably I'm not telling you anything, but in the 70s, the New Zealand Herald, which is the main uh, newspaper in New Zealand, um, they would have one or two pages that reported on Parliament. Sometimes they were reporting the speeches, other things that were going on. Um, today, virtually nothing. And my, my, my press officer, uh, in the 60s had been with the Christchurch Press and uh, Bevan Burgess was, uh, you know, a powerful figure in his own right. He, he understood PR, he understood uh, what people, uh, and was important in the long run and he certainly taught me a lot. In Canada, I'm not sure to what extent this is on the radar in New Zealand, but it has been really quite a revelation, the so-called Twitter files, that um, so much of the social media has been systematically controlled by, in this case, U.S. government uh, agencies, both paying them and censoring them. It's really quite disturbing. But also in Canada itself, we have some 2,000 media outlets that are, are uh, subsidized in addition to our state broadcaster, the CBC. Um, are you concerned that, that the media has frankly been so controlled by these vested interests, these, um, these special interests as we've referred about earlier? Does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me really. I, I think uh, in New Zealand we have a situation, you take the New Zealand Herald, um, there's virtually none of the reporting that went on in the 60s and 70s. Uh, um, unless it's uh, juicy and, you know, uh, they're not interested. And that's a tragedy. Wow. So it, it begs a lot of serious questions, doesn't it, about how COVID-19 was managed so that, frankly, this doesn't happen again around the world. So as you look at then the world context, um, and I know there's so many themes I could ask you about, but one is the whole World Economic Forum. And it almost seems that there's a set of movements, competing movements going on in the world um, without generalizing too much. But one is focused more on nationalism or accountability, the notion that people want to be in a community, a democracy, if you will, where people have a vote and control, frankly, over their destiny. On the other hand, you have a kind of a world movement. And of course we need international cooperation, but there's this, the so-called globalists who are about, uh, frankly, moving a lot of authority to an international level. Do you think that kind of global movement is a healthy one then for democracy and for people to be empowered to make the choices to live their lives the way they see fit? Um, probably not, no, I don't. Uh, I think, uh... Each country should be running itself to the best of its ability. If they want to uh, form an alliance with uh, and an association with another country, so be it. But to me, um, it's more about domination than, than helping others. Quite Indeed. Often. So we would share that concern. Um, so the other side to my questions relate to um, so-called modern monetary theory. And I, I, I suspect that concept was not even heard of in the 1980s, to my knowledge. But this whole notion is that money is almost um, endlessly growing on trees and that mm. deficits really don't matter. Our prime minister is quoted wildly, um, pardon me, widely as saying deficits or the budget can balance itself, implying that deficits really don't matter. I guess what strikes me about that is that it almost leads to an inevitable path where politicians can use your money 
and they can't resist using it to buy your vote. So has is that kind of almost absurd theory of economics got us into a mess that we're in now where so many governments are almost teetering on the financial edge? Um, I would say yes. Um, look, uh, if I look at New Zealand today, we are in deep, deep trouble. And the reason we're in deep, deep trouble is that we don't account for our debts in a proper way. And mm. I think a whole lot of countries, and New Zealand is in, in deep trouble, I would say as much as we were in the 80s, because we have unfunded liabilities which are massive and we don't record them in the books of accounts. And I think most countries don't. And I'm talking about the debt that we owe to the retired uh, or the soon to be retired for health and um, pensions. And they are massive. Well, I mean, in New Zealand, uh, we've got unfunded liability um, of uh, over a trillion dollars, and you know, that, which is about 300, it's about 300% of New Zealand's G GDP. And that's been the case for a long time. It's why I actually formed that because I could see uh, difficulties down the track. But the politicians don't want to know about that. Um, and they don't account for it. If I'm a public company and I do not account for those liabilities, then as a director, I'll probably be thrown in jail. And yet, the government can ignore it, or the government um, decides to ignore it, and we're in deep trouble. We had the fiscal, long-run fiscal forecasts uh, for New Zealand, uh, which was published a year or so ago, um, uh, for 19, no, 2021 to 2061. And they showed that New Zealand is a huge financial problem because the ratio of the retired to the workforce is changing so dramatically. And it showed that um, our, we're going to have a fiscal deficit of 13.3%. If we go on without change, of course it won't happen, we'd have a fiscal deficit of 3.3%. We'd have debts of, you know, of, of, and, and which are huge. Now, are we going to do something about it? Doubt it, because it, it doesn't suit the politicians. They're all short term as you talked about. And wow. uh, I, think, I think that's a problem for a lot of countries. Well, Sir Roger, my observation would be, it sounds like you're describing Canada and uh, so many other Western nations as well. And, and it's almost like a, I don't know if you've, you're familiar with the term, a Ponzi scheme. Um, oh, yeah. It's like a pyramid. And don't it's worry. going, to, yeah, so when does this all come to an end? When does it, um, it's starting to come to an end now. I mean, in New Zealand, they're saying it's going to start to hit in around 2030. Mind you, Treasury doesn't talk about Ponzi scheme or anything like that. They're actually saying we're, we're looking reasonably good at the moment. But, but they also point out that by 2061, we'll be broke, you know, if you look at the numbers. They don't use those words, but exactly. Ponzi scheme pyramid. I've given Peter a paper today. I've just sent it to him that I've been writing on New Zealand uh, about the troubles that we're in and what we've got to do to get out of it. And it comes back to what we've talked about already. If we're going to get out of it in New Zealand, if we're going to create a situation where um, you know, we don't have a fiscal deficit of 13.3% of GDP, et cetera, and all the other things that go with that. We're going to have to change. And the first thing we have to do is get rid of privilege and 
slowly over the last 30 years, a lot of privilege has come back. We remove privilege and then we decide how we um, use that money in order to fix the problem. And so I've given Peter a paper. So if you want to read it, um, you're welcome. Well, that um, sounds very good. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, at Frontier that we can share that with um, uh, with a much broader audience because we are, as we look to the future, our current state of affairs, we do need to uh, turn the corner on these issues. And, and it might be really interesting to, it might be interesting to take my paper and put the Canadian numbers in, and we could compare where we're at. I think that's a, a great suggestion. I, I think it frankly raises the question: just as we can build great countries. We can also lose them. Is that right, Sir, Sir Roger? Oh well, exactly. Yeah, and and you know you've got politicians. We took, we had John Key as our premier here for nine years. He was conservative premier, but he was driven, you know, largely by the poll. In my fifty years in politics, he was probably careful the best politician I've ever seen, you know. He could work a crowd, he, uh, he could communicate. He was one of those people, the public trusted him, who could have done almost anything, but he elected to do nothing. Absolutely nothing. And, Nine, the- and, and uh, why? Why would you do that? Why was he in politics? And uh, to be loved. Maybe he was for a long time. He was certainly great at, at, at the game, but it's hardly a game, is it? No. And it's not about the politician. It should be about serving the people. And and Absolutely. so on that note, I, I did want to, as we get kind of the end of our discussion, um, we've covered a lot of ground from the history of um, New Zealand uh, to, to the lessons learned from reform to reflecting on some of the the key themes that almost seem to be repeating again today. Um, What would you say is the legacy that you've left as you reflect on those 50 years within the political realm? Well, when I got the left politics or parliament in 1990, I hoped I'd um, created some lasting changes. And that's true, some of the policies are still there and it's lucky they are because uh, they're helping us move forward. But in the end, we're going backwards because politicians are coming in and and their their interests are the next election, uh, not what's good for the country. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, You've got to elect and and get more politicians in who want to do what's good for the country, not rather than themselves. And I don't think we are attracting um, people into politics uh, that um, will do that. Uh, well, we certainly are not in New Zealand. We're, we're attracting, uh, frankly, the people who are standing are more likely to be the ones that you described, you know, the ones who've come up through the system, go to university, um, work for a political party, and and then become a representative. Uh, And they're they're more likely to be what Mike Moore called, said of himself, I'm tribal. In other words, Labour, right or wrong. And we don't need that. That's very well said, Sir Roger. And so as we wrap up, then, if you were to give advice to citizens in Canada, New Zealand, frankly, anywhere around the world, what action should they be taking to help move positive change forward that actually serves the people and not the world of vested interest and privilege? What would you what would your advice be? Look, I think they've got to start by asking themselves, um, will the existing political parties um, actually change? Or do we need uh, 
a new party or do we need to find a way to inject uh, people of real talent and guts into the existing parties? Now, you know, there's all those options. Uh, the small parties, do we support, support the small party? But first of all, you've got to look at what is that party saying? Which are the parties that are offering individual New Zealanders, Canadians, choice, uh, who are creating an environment where there's competition in, uh, throughout, you know, society. Because competition within government is just as important as it is uh, in the private sector. But do we have competition in, in government? No. And we should have. Why, why can't we? Uh, health is, I don't, I don't know, takes uh, seven or eight, nine percent of GDP. Why can't we have competition within health? Why does it have to be as bureaucratic as it is? Do you actually need a health department? Probably for some, you know, global things, but you don't, we, you don't need a, a monstrous uh, education department, that's for sure. Sir Roger Douglas. Thank you so much for joining us today and reflecting on the lessons learned. We so much appreciate your courage and your leadership. My pleasure. Well, that be, that uh, brings to a close uh, our program today and our discussion with Sir Roger Douglas. We hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we look forward to our next program. Be sure to check our website at www.fcpp.org. And remember, without open discussion, you're not thinking and nor are you free. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.